everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, which is uh, Lessons Learned with Docker Files and Docker Builds. So let's start off with a quick introduction, because you're probably wondering who is this guy with the red hair that is clearly excited to be here. <laughs> so hi there, I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm a tech evangelist with Datadog, which is to say I like talking about technology and software a lot. Lately, it's been about containers and Kubernetes, which is part of why I'm talking to you today. I've been a software developer and sysadmin for somewhere around 20 years. If you're having trouble believing that, then I will take it as a compliment that you think I look a lot younger than I am right now. So uh, a lot of this talk, though, comes from my lessons learned with a project uh, that I maintain called e-commerce workshop. Uh, it's a demo microservice project that we use here at Datadog to showcase how easy it is to deploy and instrument your application with Datadog across a wide variety of platforms. Uh, if you ever want to reach out to me uh, about this talk and just give me some awesome feedback or a crisp virtual high five, uh, you can find me as MartiniSoft on Twitter, GitHub, and the Datadog community Slack. So how about we go over what we'll be covering today? It's going to be a lot of information in a very short period of time. So we're going to go over uh, the you know, Docker files themselves as a crash course uh, so that we were all on the same page together. It'll be really short and sweet. And then after that, we'll talk about seven lessons that I wish I had learned uh, before I dove into this project. Then we'll talk about some awesome, somewhat hidden feature inside of uh, Docker called BuildKit and BuildX. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with some takeaways and resources so that way uh, you've got something that you can come away with after this talk. Again, it's a lot of information in a very short period of time. So let's start. If you are very familiar with Docker files, by the way, uh, you're welcome to take at this point a quick bio break or get some tea for the next few minutes. But if you aren't sure or you just want a refresher, stick with this section. So what is a Docker file anyway? Um, this is honestly what one of them looked at, uh, like in one of my projects. It's honestly deceptively simple to me. Uh, I, we could build this today if we wanted to, but uh, it could end up working event, you know, like eventually against you, uh, which I quickly learned uh, going into this project. Because there's a lot of little nuances and gotchas, which you're going to learn from me today. So if you have any background in C or C++, you might be familiar with this thing called a makefile, uh, which I believe Docker files drew some heavy inf inspiration from. I wasn't there when they originally wrote Docker and all that stuff, so I couldn't tell you if that was their actual inspiration. It just looks a lot like a makefile to me. Uh, it's honestly just a script that executes commands in order from top to bottom with arguments that, that eventually help it create a final result. If you've done some shell scripting before, it's very much like that. Uh, so now each instruction, though, creates a new layer that builds upon the previous ones, very much like you see in this diagram to the right. If you're familiar with source control like Git, it works exactly like that. The next layer down references a layer before it, and it just records the changes that happens between the file system um, they, you know, and the, with the, each instruction that, that results from that. So I remember so many guides, too, around this time were all telling me about layers and just mastering layers and remembering how layers work. And honestly, that's the biggest concept to keep in mind when it comes to Docker files and doing Docker builds. The more you understand this concept, the better. Now, keep in mind that every Docker file starts with a from command, which is its starting point. Uh, so it's usually an operating system image or something like that, which you'll build your application uh, into in some way, shape, or form. Now, speaking of layers, uh, the way that Docker gives you that sort of awesome productivity gain is via something called caching. Uh, so the simple way to explain how the caching system actually works, or generally works, I should say, is if the instruction line changes, it will automatically rebuild that layer. Uh, sometimes this can be a local file system too. So if you're doing um, any sort of like copy or add command, it will automatically know that there's something that needs to be rebuilt. Um, now remember that anytime a layer is built, say up near the top of that diagram, anything beneath it needs to get rebuilt. It's a lot like dominoes. If for the first layer rebuilds, all the rest have to follow. Because again, it's built, you know, each layer depends upon each one there. If you change the dependencies, the rest of it has to change. Very much like in your software. If a dependency changes uh, and you need to recompile your application as a result, that's got to, you know, kind of how it works. Now, each command is also very self-explanatory. Like I said, it's generally straightforward. Um, and the documentation is really good about this, and it kind of makes some recommendations for you, too. So I honestly say, like, go check out the Docker documentation. That's where the, the diagram that you're looking at came from. Um, the simplest container, honestly, can just be a from statement, and that's, that's all you have to do. Uh, but if you want to run a command, you probably want something like an entry point and then a CMD. So the difference between those two is an entry point is for a command that you're going to run, and then the arguments would be the CMD part of it. Uh, those can be overridden as well by the Docker command, but this is sort of like your baseline, your default that, that your Docker uh, image will do. 
And then for the last part, I want you to understand, I want to make sure that you remember and know some things about some of the defaults that are assumed when you build Docker files. First off, you start as root, period. That's it. Um, if you don't use the user command at all, um, every file you write into there is all going to be under the root level uh, thing. And you're like, oh, okay, it's fine. You know, you're root and it all works. Um, there's some security considerations to be had here. I'm not going to go over those today. I will give you some security, you know, tidbits and things like that, but there's going to be better talks about this stuff all around DockerCon. Uh, so again, remember you're assumed to be root by default. Also, your working directory is going to start at forward slash or, you know, basically root itself. Uh, you can change this assumption if you use the worker command. Um, this will allow you to change that baseline uh, that's there. So a lot of people will switch their stuff to say slash app to install their application, stuff like that. That's where worker can help you. Uh, don't forget that uh, you need to expose your ports if your uh, container is going to be talking to the outside world because by default, uh, everything is closed down. There's no network access whatsoever. Um, but if you need to pass any information into your container, especially for build time, there's env and arg. Uh, there are some subtle differences between the two. Um, I, you know, I would suggest using something like env to maybe have you know, some memoized like build arguments, things like that, so that way it's a little bit cleaner down the road. Now, remember, though, you shouldn't use these to pass in any secrets whatsoever, because again, remember, each of those layers is committed to the actual final image. So if you pass in an environment variable that happens to have a secret, it will get exposed inside of that container. It will be plain as day to see. There's nothing protecting it. Now, don't worry, I'll have a uh, sort of solution for you down, down the road. Um, but let's get back to the Docker file that I was mentioning before, and let's go over this lesson by lesson. So we're going to go over those seven lessons that I was mentioning. So lesson number one, be careful of the base, unless it's ASA base. Now, some of you might have groaned at that 90s reference I just made, uh, you know, but if you're scratching your head and you don't know what ASA base is, uh, since this is on the internet, let's, let's go ahead and take advantage of this. Feel free to pause this video and uh, go check out YouTube uh, or Spotify for ASA base and feel free to use that as background music for the rest of my talk. All right, you're welcome. <laughs> So uh, my first lesson pertains to uh, the from line up at the top there, which you already see me changing if you look below the, that image. Um, and uh, M Alpine images specifically, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, they're super tiny by design, but some of the things, the decisions they made inside of that particular uh, distribution uh, can cause some issues. More specifically, muscle versus glibc. And what muscle is is a modernized version of glibc, meant to be super small, just the things you need, but old habits die hard with Linux software. Uh, so some of your libraries out there and dependencies may require something a lot more modern, um, or, or not, or sorry, a lot less modern, and require something like glibc, and if it tries to compile with muscle, we'll have some problems. So personally, I couldn't really use it that often. Um, most modern Linux software should be fine here, but I hit too many issues to want to use that. So just giving you a word of caution here. Uh, it's not always a version guarantee for their packages either. It's the other reason why I couldn't deal with Alpine as much because uh, certain uh, variations and versions and stuff like that aren't always guaranteed between releases. Um, at least there's version numbers, so it's a little bit easier to follow versus if you use something like Ubuntu or Debian where you have to remember what animal name is at this time uh, to, to know if you're on a, a newer release or not. Uh, it's a whole different you know, set of uh, things you have to think about. Um, what generally works though, uh, especially for quirky software, is using slim images where possible. So anytime, like you see here, I'm using a Debian release called Buster, and then under there I'm using the slim version of that build. If you can find slim, grab it. They're great. Uh, they are uh, really small by default, uh, which means less surprises personally, less is more. Um, you know, Not having to do tons of upgrades right off the bat is also really nice, so sticking to slim images is a really good pro tip for you. Now lesson two is another one that I thought was like, as a, as a programmer, I try not to do too much stuff on one line because even I hate parsing it after the fact. But I think if you do this elegantly, it could be done pretty well. And I'm talking about chaining your run commands. So if you look at that down below, you know, this is you know, getting all of your sort of uh, Debian-based dependencies out of the way. So all the different uh, you know, shared libraries, C libraries, things like that are all brought in at, as early as possible if you can help it. But a lot of the name of this, this particular game here is layer efficiency. Remember, you want to do as much as possible between each layers and deliberately de define your layers uh, so that way you're not doing too, you know, more than necessary, uh, you know, getting the efficiency you need out of them. Now, 
each command that you run, remember that that creates a layer. So the more you can do in each layer, the better. Do your dependencies for application, you know, build time stuff early as possible, because generally speaking, those are probably not going to change as much as you think. Uh, so a typical pattern you see is that a lot of um, uh, package upgrades and all that stuff will happen it pretty much as the second line, maybe even the third line inside of a given Docker file. Like after the from statement, it's like, okay, let's get all the stuff updated inside this image so we know it's at the latest and has all the you know sort of security patches, things like that. That would be why you'd want to do that. Now, speaking of all that stuff and doing all these sort of like beautifully formatted and sorted things, uh, you want to sort your package names. This sounds really silly, but your future self will thank you when you're looking at a git diff and it's not like a crazy jumbled mess or like one long line with a bunch of stuff and you can't easily scan what package name is changed or which you know package name is being inserted or modified or whichever. So if you sort them early and often kind of like I've already done here, this will be this will pay you dividends down the road. And it sounds so little and subtle, but it also takes very little effort to do this. Lesson three is all about being very tidy with each of those layers too, which I was definitely not doing. I thought I was, but it, clearly I was not doing good enough. Uh, so cleanup again is all about that layer efficiency that I was talking about. Like installing packages, no matter what distro you're using, I'm using Debian here. So of course there's some stuff from app that it has to keep around. There's caches, there's artifacts, there's extra configs, etc. But why keep all the dead weight in your image, okay? Like be like Elsa and let it go. <clears throat> all right. I promise I will not sing again for the rest of the talk, but I had to get it out of my system. Um, remember that any cleanup operations you do need to be done in that layer as well. So if you're going to do this cleanup like I'm doing here, notice that I'm chaining it to the previous sets of commands because those you know first three commands, the app get update, upgrade, and install, end up leaving some stuff behind. And so that's where we run the app get clean and the RMRF on top of that. And it's all gonna be run in the same layer. So that layer gets nicely tidied up and ready for the next layer that comes up. So remember that, you know, you wanna do this like within that same layer. If you don't, it gets committed. So lesson four is all about handling your app dependencies, which is a little tricky depending on the language you're working with. So if you remember that layer caching system that I mentioned before, this is a lot easier to think about. Uh, and by that, I mean like every time a layer cache is rebuilt, anything depending on that layer gets rebuilt too, which is anything following that layer. So again, it's like that Domino's analogy that I mentioned before. So since your application dependency packages probably don't change too often, you wanna move those up higher up into your Docker file. So that way, since they're not getting changed too often, though you get to take advantage of that sweet layer caching to make things a little bit faster, more efficient. Your source code probably changes more often, so you want to put that near the bottom or as close to the bottom as possible. So that way, if it changes, it's not redoing you know four or five layers uh, above it. Because especially if you look over here with the the Python example file, if there's a lot of Python dependencies, it has to go through you know Python package uh, index and grab all your files and install them and run them and you know sitting there doing that every time. Uh, it you know it just starts reminding me of the XKCD comic of like why aren't you doing anything? It's like oh because the app is still compiling, but be the Docker equivalent of that, right? Um, so again, remember, if it's not a compiled language, bring in your, your source code near the very end. Uh, compiled languages, you can reverse this, actually, because all you're really caring about is the, the binary at the end. So that one, you don't kind of get the same sort of advantage that way, but you also have less things to think about because you're not needing to bring in the source code every time. You just need the binary to run, and you're good to go. So. The other uh, next lesson here was uh, a file that I honestly didn't know about until I started digging into this stuff, uh, was, which is a Docker ignore file. Um, just by applying these two lines alone that you see on, on this uh, slide is, you know, cut me around 100 megabytes out of an image, uh, which is pretty crazy to think about just by doing those two lines, because it turns out, hey, you don't need your entire Git history uh, to go into your container. It, this is the easiest, if anything, probably like the one thing I could have retitled my, my whole talk to is just use a Docker ignore file already. Um, <laughs> I, there's a lot of projects that don't have them, and honestly, they could benefit greatly from doing them. Uh, they, they, it's, you know, when you're not bringing in that entire, you know, Git history with you, uh, it saves you so much, especially if it's an older project. You really want to just at least just, you know, pause my video, add that to your file, watch the Docker builds get even smaller. 
Now, this file works exactly like a git ignore file if you're familiar with git. Uh, we're basically will avoid copying files and directories that you instruct it to uh, as long as you're using an add or copy command inside of your Docker file. It will filter all of those ads or copies through this sort of like basically sort of deny list of like anything you wanted to not keep uh, with there. Because you likely don't need the Docker file inside of your Docker image. Uh, it sounds very meta to do a Docker within a Docker, but you, you can. You don't need to. Probably don't want to. Um, but you definitely don't need your Git history with you either. You just want your current file system as it is. There might be a very special reason why you would need it. I'm just saying most of the time you don't. Uh, and again, when you're doing this stuff too, especially if you're tweaking your Docker ignore file and you're not sure what to put in there, uh, go peek at your final images and see like everything going on in your file system inside of your Docker image. Like mount your container, uh, go poking around the file system, you know, use the tree command, go nuts and, and take a look at everything in there. Like, do you really need everything inside there? Is that all what you need to make your application run? Chances are probably not. And lesson six here is all about a killer feature I like in Docker called multi-stage builds. Uh, so multi-stage builds are a really awesome superpower, but like any superpower, it should be used responsibly. So technically speaking, you're probably already doing multi-stage builds and may not even know about it. You're kind of doing them like I'm doing here. Uh, the as part that you see, if you just even remove that, technically this is still a multi-stage build in a way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm using the Golang 1.16 container as my base. You know, so unless you're really going from scratch somewhere, because uh, from scratch is the, the simplest, smallest container possible, but most operating system builds even start from there. So you're probably already doing multi-stage builds, congratulations. But this is a more specific way of doing it by also renaming the each of the, uh, the build layers so that way I can reference them later. Now, if you, you know, go this route too, you can organize your multi-stage builds to where the earlier stages are, again, for all those low traffic, low modification files. Those go up near the top, those are earlier. Um, that way you're not doing a whole lot you know, happening there. The nice advantage you get here, uh, at least with Golang, because it's a compiled language, um, we can uh, control the dependencies, put them in much earlier, all of our source code goes up there, and, and all we're really concerned about running is really that binary uh, and maybe any sort of C library dependencies that, that it might need at, at runtime. Um, so if you're not, you're not doing like static compiling, you're doing you know dynamic compiling, all that stuff, this is where you can use you know, one separate set of containers to do all the building and all that crazy stuff, bring in your build tool chain. And then you take the results that you're interested in, which is usually just a binary, yank that out into a newer container where it's got a clean slate, no other build artifacts, no other other stuff, because all you really need is that binary, and then you can just run that. Uh, makes things a lot simpler and easier to do as far as uh, trying not to copy too many things in at once, right? Now, remember though, this can bring in a whole new level of complexity because now you have to think about you know, the different layers and cache busting at multiple levels. Because again, if you say modify that, that, that first two lines of that file, uh, that means the copy down the bottom gets invalidated and now it has to rebuild everything above it. Uh, so just because you're, you're doing that one side doesn't mean the other doesn't get affected. Uh, so remember, you're just creating dependencies but at, in a different sort of way. Um, there's a lot of other advantages too, but the copy is actually really, really cool. The last but not least is labeling everything. And this is actually a bigger surprise to me than anything else in this talk. Uh, I know you've got an inner office manager inside of you just waiting, waiting to just label all the things, right? Uh, if you've been around Docker for a minute or even done some Docker searching, you probably saw something like the maintainer command. Um, which has long since been deprecated, so please don't use it. If you see it, remove or replace it with a label instead. Um, if you look at the the, the file that I have it, it, uh, there, this is the newer version of the maintainer thing. So it's label maintainer equals and then the maintainer information. Um, so the label itself is a key value store uh, in a way that provides sort of metadata about your container. Um, this can be seen inside of the Docker inspect command and all that stuff. Um, this can also get picked up. Uh, by different things such as Kubernetes. Kubernetes can now you know, pull those in and that's your new additional key value metadata that gets pulled into the Kubernetes uh, CRDs and all that stuff. So uh, if, you know, you know, if you're using say like the Datadog product, if you have Datadog running uh, your auto discovery stuff inside of your Kubernetes cluster, so if you have cluster monitor running, uh, we will look for these particular labels. If you look down two labels below, you see the com datadog hq.ad. That is the auto discovery uh, check builds right there. So in your Docker container, you can specify 
how Datadog should sort of monitor and look at your uh, particular service. So this kind of helps bridge that gap between your developers and your operators to where the developers can also be a little bit more prescriptive about how uh, your services should get monitored. Uh, it's kind of that more DevOpsy way of doing things. Um, another thing too is there's also a standard set of labels out there, believe it or not, uh, that I will link to at the very end of this talk. Now, is anyone catching the reference, the subtle reference I've got inside my example here? It is one of my favorite scenes inside of Jurassic Park when Lex, the young girl, uh, you know, discovers that the park is running on a Unix system and she just like, she's like, I got this, you know, I, I just, I, I, get a, I get like a little nerdy kid and I go bananas every time I see that scene. She's like, I know this, it's a Unix system. Um, if you haven't seen that scene, uh, by all means, after my talk, go watch Jurassic Park. It's a great movie. So we're near the end here, but there's a lot of information. I still got a little bit more to talk about because I, I haven't really, you know, touched on BuildKit and BuildX yet. So to start, uh, BuildKit is awesome. That's all I got to say. I wish I'd known about it sooner. Uh, it was something that I, I kind of gleaned through an older DockerCon talk, ironically enough, and this was years ago, because this uh, system first appeared inside of Docker back in September 2019, uh, somewhere around the 1809 release, if you're tracking release numbers. And it was all behind a feature flag, though, um, which, however, it's you know, being slowly merged into the main build command, so stuff is moving over. Um, but I'll mention why that, that is uh, very shortly. Now, if you want to you know, go ahead and peek behind the feature flag, you can put in docker underscore build kit equals one as an environment variable per command, kind of like I'm doing here in this example that you see. If you would rather just rip the curtain off already and just go nuts with it, uh, this uh, snippet right here of JSON can go right into your Docker engine config and you can restart your Docker engine to get that to be enabled all the time. Now, once you enable it, uh, run docker build X and you'll see something like this. Um, I said Docker build X, and that's only because you'll get all the Docker build kit stuff. Again, this is where the sort of two worlds um, sort of collide because Docker build has some things that Docker build X already has too. Again, they're getting merged in slowly, but build X will get you access to all the cool stuff. Um, but why? Like, why even wanting to go do this? Why should you go check it out? Um, honestly, build kit is, to me, a major rethinking of how we do container builds. Um, it's, it addresses a lot of the problems that have been plaguing Docker builds and Docker container stuff for quite a while. The big famous one, to me at least, because uh, I've had issues with this in the past, is passing secrets into your container build time. So remember before when I said don't use your arg or env commands to pass in any secrets because it will get committed to the layer? Well, with Docker build kit, you can actually mount secrets temporarily per, on a per layer basis. You can say, okay, in this run command, I want you to mount this uh, given secret, which the Docker build command can pass in at the build time and that will get loaded into that layer. The layer can do whatever it needs to, and then it will get thrown away before the layer is committed. So that way it doesn't end up in your final build. Uh, this is super powerful if you use it. Um, you can also pass in SSH agent keys for that particular uh, uh, system just like uh, before. It will actually pass in the agent directly, so if you have your keys mounted outside of the Docker build command, they can be passed into the Docker build command if you need to, say, private repo clone another, uh, say, dependency or something like that inside your build chain. Now, part of why this is still behind an experimental flag is because of a newer intermediary format for caching. Uh, so kind of like how compilers like you know, Go or C work, where it, it creates a sort of intermediary language format before it creates the binary that it does you know, all, the, all the heavy lifting. Um, that's part of what uh, BuildKit is doing too. Now this allows it to do things like concurrent builds, where if it has you know, sort of common information, it can try to effectively thread that process. Um, so that way you can get some interesting efficiencies out of a lot of the stuff. Now, some newer plugins as well uh, that are part of that system uh, allow you to do uh, push your build cache to registries. So this would mean you can, if you're using uh, Docker Hub right now, you can push your local build cache up to Docker Hub. So if you have multiple builders, they can all pull from that cache too. So you gain some insane efficiency this way. So then actually cut your CI build time and by at least a third, if not half or more, depending on sort of how your stuff sort of works. Now, uh, the asterisk I have there here is because Docker Hub is still the only registry I know of that currently supports this feature. I know Google, Amazon, and Azure registries uh, were mentioning supporting this, but I haven't been able to test it as of this recording. So. 
your mileage may vary. You can give it a shot and see if it works. If it doesn't, then by all means demand that your cloud provider start supporting it. It's a really awesome feature. Um, and then for the observability buffs like me, because hey, I work at Datadog, um, you can emit tracing data uh, via open tracing uh, for the performance of your build. So if you want to pull that into Datadog so you can continuously monitor your uh, application builds and see how efficient you're, you're doing this over time, because again, these efficiency things are, you know, can, it's not like you, you know, go through and you add your Docker ignore file and now you're done. You don't have to ever optimize or change anything. You know, your apps are usually living creatures. They are getting changed, modified, built, rebuilt by any number of people. And, you know, eventually stuff changes. So you want to constantly reevaluate this stuff. And this is where doing something like open tracing might actually help you uh, keep a good uh, close eye to it. Uh, the other thing I'm very ex excited about too is multi-arch builds. I can build uh, ARM64 and AMD64 at the same time. So if I want to make a Raspberry Pi edition of uh, my app and everything, I can do those at the same time with the right tooling, of course. Uh, there's some asterisk there again, because this is, there, it requires some very specific things in order for it to do this. Um, but there's honestly a lot more uh, things I need to be covering. Like if you're, if you're a Podman fan, uh, it can talk to Podman, believe it or not. Just look at the documentation, it's all there. Um, but again, I, I don't have enough time to list everything in here, so let's go ahead and wrap up. So that's a lot of information. So remember, don't forget to pay attention to the base, especially if it's ASA base. Hopefully you're still listening to ASA base. If not, feel free to tune in after the talk. It's a good band from the 90s. Um, less is more with commands. Don't forget to compact them, chain them together for efficiency. Layer efficiency is a very big key. Uh, invest some time in multi-stage builds. Uh, you know, they can be worth it if you, you know, build, plan it out and test it with your team. Make sure you know about the trade-offs you're taking and, and giving with them. They can be really awesome systems, especially if you have things where you have like a development set of builds and then maybe you have your release set of builds, that sort of thing. Multi-stage builds can actually be a really huge advantage for that. Don't forget to clean up after your packages and use that damn Docker ignore file uh, that I didn't use before and was honestly like the single trick that made everything better. And of, of course, you got to label all the things. Label everything. Put labels on all of it, really. Uh, and then, of course, go try out BuildKit and BuildX if you haven't already. Uh, if you aren't doing it right now during this talk because you're like, wait, that's a thing? Yes, it is. So uh, here's the resources and everything because we're wrapping up the talk here. Uh, Docker Docs, if you go there and search for BuildKit, that will get you kind of the entry point to get started. It's not complete because, again, BuildKit is still a sort of living creature that is being modified, changed, and all that all the time. It's slowly getting merged back into a lot of the Docker stuff that you see. Uh, the e-commerce workshop project, if you want to go see like what I've been doing with uh, those builds, there's going to be a lot more crazy stuff there coming after DockerCon. Um, if you want to know about all those standard labels I was talking about, so if you're publishing your container publicly and all that, uh, this is something you really want to check out. It is, at this point now, almost ratified. It's I think it's an RC candidate or something like that. Uh, but it's the Open Containers Initiative. They've got a specific one called Annotations. It's a very specific spec for this. And then if any cool tool that you get out of this whole talk uh, is called Dive. Uh, Dive is really cool. Grab it. Uh, it. It will actually let you go through each layer of your container and like look at the, the file system at each layer to see kind of what's going on. Um, that will tell you if you've started collecting any dead weight inside of your container or just a good way to kind of educate yourself about what should be in your Docker ignore file. So by all means, go check that one out too. Now that's about all the time I've got. We're right at time here. Uh, so I just want to say thank you again for your time and for attending DockerCon. Have a great day.